Good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you joined us today. I'm Sarah. This is Micah. We're the pastors at the Vine Church in Tri-Cities. We are so happy to be together, even just virtually today. So thank you for joining us. We are also really excited about all the progress that is happening at our new building. Uh, we've had youth group there. We've had some small groups meet there. And we've done a ton of work there. It's coming together nicely. It is. We're in the middle of AV right now, trying to get all that lined out. But in saying all that, we wanted to update you. Um, wanted to say that, uh, encourage you in pencil to write in the date of our first Sunday morning in-person uh, service. And I say in pencil, but I know many of you probably don't even have a paper calendar. Many of us use an electronic calendar, but it's our tentative date in two weeks on March 7th. So we will send out more information and what that will look like and all the COVID precautions in place and, and all that stuff. But we're really excited to get together on Sunday morning again. Yeah, and as we move forward with that, you'll have the opportunity to sign up to register for Sunday morning gatherings on our website. And again, we'll be sending out emails and getting you more information. Excited for what's ahead. A lot of busyness, but a lot of good things happening and, and we just can't wait. So I love to be out in nature. Uh, if, if, mm -hmm. I, if I need time just to uh, go inside, go internal, uh, often I find myself needing to be in nature to accomplish that. And this last year, I was fortunate to be able to go a few times up uh, into um, the Autanum Mountains, the mm -hmm. up Autanum Ridge, uh, west of here near Yakima, um, to a place called Blue Lake. And it's this beautiful lake Is at that blue? some 6,000 <laughs> feet of elevation, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and no, it's not blue anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little bit murkier. Apparently it was once just crystal clear blue. I don't know. That's a story told of it. At any rate, it's a beautiful place and it's re remote up high in the mountains and miles and miles from anything else. And on one of my trips up there, uh, what's interesting is I love the wilderness. I love to be away, but uh, there can sometimes be some struggle uh, mm -hmm. or uh, difficulty in the wilderness. Uh, one of those trips, I was driving up the mountain and um, I came across a herd of a 30 or 40 elk. Um, and it was, yeah, it was beautiful, incredible. And, um, I get up to Blue Lake and I spend my time fly fishing and, and, you know, cooking a meal over my little propane grill and, and that sort of thing. And that night I go to bed in a hammock and in the middle of the night I was, um, awoken by a, a male elk bellowing some 40 yards from me and I he's stomping and snorting and making all sorts of sounds it was a terrifying moment so here I, I am feeling totally exposed in my hammock of course out of my hammock with flashlights and uh and looking around at that point uh, but I love to get away into the wilderness it's an opportunity for me to connect with God uh, but the wilderness also presents some challenges this week we started Lent on Wednesday along with Christians all over the world. And we talked about Lent last week. Lent is the season before Easter. And so it's 40 or 46 days, depending on if you count the Sundays. And it's a time of preparation, a time of fasting. It's a time in which we reflect, we confess, we repent, and we intentionally turn to God. And we also invited you guys last week, if you weren't with us, just want to mention this, that we invited the church to join us in a church-wide devotional plan. It's on new version. It's called Lent for Everyone. We, we're reading through the Gospel of Matthew. So if you'd like to join us, you, there's still time. You can still do that at any point. We'll post a link for you if you're on Facebook with us right now. Absolutely. Um, last week, we also introduced this concept of wilderness. And the wilderness is a place of difficulty, but it's also a place in which God strengthens us and God meets us in the wilderness and shapes us and transforms us. And so we're thinking about Lynn as an intentional journey into the wilderness where we we pray we fast we confess we repent and God meets us there and God strengthens and God transforms us and so today we're gonna spend some time in Matthew 4 in the story of Jesus spending time in the wilderness Matthew chapter 4 then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil 
After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I'll give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended to him. What an interesting story. So why is Jesus in the wilderness? Why, why is he there? I think one significant thing to point out is the timeline of events. This is right after Jesus's baptism. So Jesus goes to John the Baptist and asks him to baptize him. And when he does, a voice from heaven speaks over, over Jesus. And, and the voice of God says, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And the spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes down in the shape of a dove and lands on Jesus. So there's this beautiful moment of, of just affirmation and declaration of love and divine identity for Jesus. And immediately after, immediately after this glimpse of this relationship within the Trinity, or that is the Trinity, this relationship of love, the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. So from this place of love and affirmation, the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. So there's a divine purpose for this journey into the wilderness. And we will see how Jesus, um, in the wilderness, we'll see how Jesus operates. We'll see how Jesus is going to live out his his time on earth and live uh, do his ministry. Yeah, having been confirmed at his baptism as mm -hmm. the Son of God, now we'll begin to catch a glimpse of what, as the Son of God, he is living into. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so today, as we look at these temptations, we'll be exploring both what is Satan trying to do in this moment, uh, how is he tempting, and also, uh, what do we learn from Jesus? What does it look like to live into our relationship with God uh, in spite of the challenges or temptation? So Jesus uh, is led by the Spirit into the, de into the wilderness, and he's fasting during this time. Now, fasting was a common practice in Israel. Um, it, there was uh, religious holidays or ceremonies that they would fast during. Uh, it also was associated with a time of contemplation or prayer. Um, and uh, in this case, Jesus' time in the desert and his time fasting, it was marking a new season in life. It was a transitionary moment in his life in which he chose to give up food uh, during this time and lean into his relationship with God. Hmm. And so it's at the end of these 40 days, which by the way is a long time, <laughs> 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness that the devil comes to Jesus and begins to tempt him. And before we look carefully at, at those three temptations, I want to just ask the question, well, so what is a temptation? What, what is this word that's um, referred to here? In Greek, um, it's often translated either to tempt or to test. And it can have different connotations. So one connotation is I'm uh, tempting as in laying a trap, trying to trick someone into doing something and test in that way. But another connotation is to examine closely, to reveal the true nature or the character of someone or something. And so this time in the wilderness is going to clarify and reveal more fully who Jesus is. And so we're going to look at each temptation and we're going to ask, so what was the temptation and how did Jesus respond? So after 40 days of fasting in the desert, he was very hungry. This seems a pretty obvious... <laughs> Overstatement. I mean, understatement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so Satan comes to him and tempts him, challenges 
tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus' response, man shall not live by bread alone. So at first glance, when I read that, I'm like, what would, what would be wrong with Jesus turning some stones into bread? I mean, he's got unlimited power. Why not use some of it to, to eat? It would be very resourceful of Jesus. And I, for one, like to be resourceful. I hate wasting food. Um, sometimes we have leftover night. I, probably you do too. Leftover night can look differently at our house. Um, sometimes we have enough leftovers, enough food in the, in the, all the little containers that we lay out all the individual containers and everyone scoops out what they want and then pops their plate in the microwave, uh, modern conveniences. So, so nice. But other times we just have a little bit of food in each container. And so I've been known to just throw everything in a skillet add some scrambled eggs to it and call it a stir fry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I find that to be very resourceful. So I'm, I'm curious here, um, being resourceful is good. What, what is with this specific temptation? So this, the temptation, and, and Satan is manipulating Jesus. The uh, first statement is, if you are the Son of God. So it's interesting. In the Greek, it kind of acknowledges Jesus is the Son of God, and yet it adds this word, mm -hmm. If it, mm -hmm. it's a combination of both the acknowledgement and the question of his mm -hmm. character, and so Satan comes manipulating him. So if you are, well, then I need you to prove it to me. Now, of course, Jesus has nothing to prove mm -hmm. in this moment. He does not have to. Um, the other interesting thing I think about the way Satan is operating in this moment is that he is tempting Jesus uh, at his weakest moment. Mm -hmm. with what he would desire most in that moment. And I think this is often true of the temptations we face in life. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus replies to Satan by quoting the word of God, by quoting scripture. He quotes Deuteronomy 8 and he says, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, the context of Deuteronomy 8 is Moses speaking to the Israelite people. And he's saying to them, when you get to the promised land, when you get there, remember what God has done for you in the wilderness. Remember how he fed you. Remember how your clothes didn't wear out, how God took care of you. So in responding with this scripture, Jesus is focusing on God's faithfulness to care for his people. Yeah. So uh, now in, in this moment, food, like food is necessary uh, to yeah. live. And Jesus having gone this long is extremely hungry. He does need food. And further, bread itself is not sinful. So really, what is the temptation? Mm -hmm. uh, this temptation uh, is to choose his own comfort over what might be as or more important. This temptation actually leads to an opportunity for Jesus to highlight mm -hmm. for us something that is equally necessary to bread. So he doesn't say bread is not necessary, food is not necessary. Uh, instead, he says equally necessary in life is God and God's word in our lives. He chooses to lean into that relationship with God as opposed to indulge what he desires in that moment. Then the second temptation, the devil takes Jesus to the highest point of the temple and he says to him, if you are the son of God, God, there's that phrase again, then jump off and the angels will protect you. And the devil quotes a scripture as he's uh, tempting Jesus. He quotes Psalm 91, which is a song about God protecting his people. So he said, see, God will protect you. Go ahead and jump off. And again, Jesus responds with a different scripture. In Deuteronomy 6, he says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Just jump. As a teenager, our, our favorite, one of our favorite experiences uh, or activities. Whenever was, Micah starts a story with, as a teenager. <laughs> yeah, there's something, yeah, there's something to that. Um, cliff jumping. And there's an incredible place over by Fishhook about a half hour from here. And so we would go a couple times a week out cliff jumping. And there was like a 35 foot high cliff that was uh, really fun that we spent a lot of time on. So but there fun. was... One higher one. There was one 60-footer that we'd seen people do occasionally. One day we decided to give that a shot, and um, two of us went up to do it. The guy that went before me 
uh, came up uh, both excited but saying he had hit bottom. He had touched oh. bottom uh, of, of the river there. Um, and I remember standing there um, thinking, well, maybe this isn't the best idea. <laughs> um, but also knowing that I could jump further than him. So thinking it, it might be okay. And I remember that moment of kind of the pressure of people watching, mm-hmm. just jump. It's time to go. Jesus here is in a very different situation yes. than I'm describing there. However, the temptation is go for it. You know, live wildly, do this because you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jesus was definitely being pressured here by the devil and the devil is adaptive this is one thing that really strikes me in this story so in the first temptation jesus responds to satan with scripture so in the second temptation satan misuses scripture satan quotes scripture to jesus to try to get him to um, jump off uh, here to test god and so what really strikes me here is that satan is a formidable opponent. Um, he's There's a reason why he's called the deceiver. Um, he's clever in how he twists truth and turns half truths on, um, you know, to, to, to try to get, manipulate people to do something. I'm reminded of, reminded of Ephesians 6 verse 10 and 11. It says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The devil's schemes. Um, and, And our strength to resist the devil, our strength to respond in a godly way can only come from God. Okay, so Jesus responds uh, in an interesting way to Satan. He says, it's true that is written in scripture, but it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Uh, a few minutes ago, Sarah described the words in Greek that are translated often to tempt or to test. And in this case, the, uh, the word does have the connotation of to trap. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, 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 Jesus is responding to him saying, don't try to trap God. Just because you have the ability or trust in God's faithfulness or goodness in this moment in your life, don't try to trap him in this. So he's saying that our motivation and our purpose for for doing something matters. So we don't try to um, manipulate or control God. We don't try to force God's hand thinking, oh, if I do this, then God will have to do this. Instead, Jesus takes on this posture of surrender. And he surrenders to God and he says, I, I will trust in God's love and in his faithfulness and in his care for me. And so in the third temptation, uh, Satan takes him to a high point and he shows him the kingdoms of the world. And he says, uh, bow down and worship me and I'll give you all of these. Jesus responds, away from me, Satan. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So again, the devil adapts his tactics. He tries to tempt Jesus with empire, with wealth, with um, with power, with fame, with splendor. He says, I'll give you all this, the shiny splendor of these kingdoms if only you will bow down and worship me. And so the devil's ultimate desire and agenda really comes to light here that Satan wants to be worshipped. Satan wants control. And this is the crux of all the temptations in this time spent in the wilderness. To whom will Jesus surrender? To whom will he give control? And that's an amazing question for us to ask. To whom will we surrender? Yeah, Yeah, and Jesus' response is twofold. First, away from me, Satan. And it's so clear, concise, so poignant. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had moments in life where you sense evil uh, around you, in you, in that moment, that there is evil here in this time and place. And there's been a number of times in my life when I have prayed that prayer um, away from me, be Mm -hmm. gone in the name of Jesus. And uh, and in this moment, Jesus says those words, um, away from me, Satan. And then the second thing he demonstrates for us is this idea of worshiping 
God only. Not only is it the absence of evil in his life that mm -hmm. he desires in this moment, but it is the full presence of God, the only one worthy of our worship. So as we look at, oh, before we go into that, at the very end, Satan leaves and angels come and take care of Jesus. Mm -hmm. After after all the temptations, angels come and take care of him. I think that is such a powerful, beautiful point. Mm -hmm. So what is it that we learn from Jesus, uh, his experience in the wilderness? For the first thing that really stands out to me is that Jesus recognized and listened to the voice of God above all other voices, and specifically here above Satan's voice. I read a little bit about noise pollution this week, and it's becoming an increasingly um, big problem, uh, especially out in nature. There's actually people um, who are acoustic ecologists here in Washington who are going out to record the sound of nature. They're recording just without all the man-made noise, what does nature sound like? Because these um, environmental uh, portraits, sound portraits are, are vanishing. They're, they're going away. And so I thought that was really interesting. In our lives, we too deal with noise pollution, but, but in a different way. We hear so many voices, TV, radio, our friends and family, so many different voices telling us different things. Uh, or the internet, have you ever tried to research something <laughs> and like a bunch of different, different things come up? One of the benefits of going on a wilderness journey is just stripping away all all this noise, the, stripping away the different voices that tell us different things and learning to recognize and to hear the voice of God, the voice of truth, the voice of love and practicing that. And that, that's, that's something we have to practice. That's something we have to learn to do. Yeah, so we learn from Jesus. The wilderness it allows us to strip away some things mm -hmm. and, uh, that we can um, be in the presence of and hear the voice of God. Secondly, we learn from Jesus' experience in the wilderness that Satan is crafty, that he comes in the case of Jesus at his weakest and in our lives at our weakest to strike where we're most vulnerable. Uh, second thing we learned that we hadn't talked about yet it, about Satan and his tactics in this text is that um, it was in a season of greater focus on God, in a season of transition, in a season of leaning more fully into his calling and his relationship with God, that Satan comes to Jesus to tempt him. And I think this is often true in our lives. I've experienced the same thing, that in seasons of breakthrough, we will also experience some of the greatest challenge. Mm -hmm. The third thing we learned from Jesus in the wilderness is that he uses scripture to resist each temptation. Uh, Hebrews 4 says, for the word of God is alive and active, alive and active. So the word of God is one of the tools that God uses to reveal himself to us. And now we see in the story and we see it today how scripture can definitely be misused. But when used properly, when read with attentiveness to the Holy Spirit and read with attention to context and, and the overarching narrative of God's work in this world, God uses scripture to speak to us. And it is a beautiful gift from God. And so we can use scripture to resist temptation. Mm hmm so here we are in the season of Lent, and we've kind of described it as this intentional journey into the wilderness where we strip some things away that we can give ourselves more fully to God in the season. Um, and from the, the story of Jesus and his time in the wilderness, we know that there might come temptation, that, that Satan might try to challenge us in the season, but Jesus dem demonstrates for us the ability to lean into our relationship with mm -hmm. God, to trust upon the word of God, in this season and to listen to the voice of spirit the spirit as we are guided through this season in this season of lent we choose to lean in to god and the final words of our story today were and angels came and attended to him to jesus and i don't know what that looked like in that moment nor do i know exactly what it's going to look like 
in your life mm-hmm. or in mine as we go into this season, as we continue in the season of Lent. But I knew, do know this. James chapter 4, verse 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And so in the season of Lent, as we lean into our relationship with God, we trust and know that he draws near to us in this moment. This week, we want to invite you to a practice um, for Lent and for the future. But the practice is memorizing scripture. It is so good to have scripture just right there when we encounter things. And so we want to invite you to pick a passage. Uh, Maybe it's a passage that God has been uh, drawing you to and speaking to you on. Uh, Or maybe there's a specific situation that comes to mind and you want to respond differently. And so you wanna pick a passage that will help you respond in a way that, that you believe God is calling you to. We want to invite you to pick a passage and memorize scripture so that it's right there. And when you need it, you can quote you can that scripture, you can meditate on that scripture, and you can live into that scripture. One of the ones that um, I'd like to do this week, it, it's a short verse, John 3, 30. 30. Um, it's John the Baptist, what he says about Jesus. And he says, he must become greater. Jesus must become greater and I must become less. And in the season of Lent, um, that is so applicable. Our our desire is for us to really lean in to Jesus and that Jesus would become greater in our lives. Yeah, let's pray about that. Mm -hmm. God, we thank you for this day and this time. We thank you for your word. Um, We thank you for the season of Lent in which we can uh, deny ourselves something and lean more fully into, give ourselves more fully to you. And so, God, we pray uh, your blessing. We pray that you will help us as we experience temptation or struggles in life. We pray, God, that you will, as we draw near to you, God, that you will draw near to us so we can know your presence and your love. Spirit, we invite you in this season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today, as we sign off, we want to leave you with a worship song. And today I just chose an old hymn. Um, It's a beautiful hymn. It's called I Surrender, originally written by Van Deventer, if I'm saying that correctly. But it's redone, and it's an acoustic version of this hymn. And I love the first verse, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him, and in his presence daily live. May we take on this posture this Lent. Amen. Hey friends, thank you for joining us. We can't wait to see you soon. Blessings. Bye.